Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. Today, I want to continue or pick up where I left off last week in our study, What Does the Bible Say About Hell? Part 2. The reason why I want to talk about this and the reason why I think it's so important is I was reading an article not long ago and it talked about how pastors are getting away from talking about hell because it's not so appealing. It's not a topic that brings people to church. In some instances, pastors believe that it drives them away because it's so judgmental and so harsh and cruel. And you see, most people, if you listen to them, they don't want to talk about a God that they believe will send you to hell. They would like to see God as this loving God who just, just loves us so much. He could never condemn us to eternal judgment. I understand the desire to see God that way because he is. I love God. I love the loving aspect of our Heavenly Father. But either he's the loving God who tells the truth or he's the loving God of people's imagination that loves but lies. And so you and I both know, as we've talked about before, nobody really talks about hell in the Bible more than Jesus. Therefore, it's, it's something that we have to take into consideration, a strong consideration, I should say, because Jesus talked about it and he wa wasted no words. He was not one to just spend time talking for talking's sake. Every time he opened his mouth, he uttered the truth, not a truth, the truth. And see, just because people don't want to talk about it doesn't take away the reality of it. And so we're going to talk about it today because it's an important topic. Remember, the shortest part of your existence is, is your earthly life. Your earthly life, the Bible refers to as a mist here for a moment and it's gone. And it's the shortest part of your existence is here on this earth. Eternity is all of this. It's important to get eternity right. And also the time to get eternity right is now because once we enter into eternity, all decisions are made. It's all said and done. And so it's important, even though this is not one of those popular topics or one that people like to talk about, or one that they don't like to view God through the lens of as being a God who will actually bring eternal judgment. It doesn't matter whether they like it or not. What really matters is if it's true. And so there is a teaching today called universalism. It's not new. In fact, uh, one of the first century theologians talked about it, a uh, scholar by the name of Origen. And what he said was about universalism, let me tell you some of the scriptures he used to express this e universalism theology or thinking or philosophy. They would take some scriptures and use them to encompass the entire Bible, disregarding everything other than what they wanted to believe. So one of the verses or scriptures that's used, one is very familiar to you. Here's what they like. And, and I'm going to read this to you so you can get a picture of how universalism and other doctrines work. Remember, no scripture is of private interpretation where you can take a little and expand on it and make it whatever you want. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son in the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That is excellent. I love that. Then it says, he who believes in him, though, is not judged. So if you were to stop where it says that Jesus came to save the world or God sent him to save the world through him, if you stop right there, you have a really, really nice philosophy or theology. But it says, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God. In other words, if you say God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, the world, he actually did, but not all will believe. And those that don't, he says, of them 
which those who believe in universalism don't seem to think or, or believe is that unless you accept his son, unless you believe in him, even right now in this moment, you stand condemned already. I know that doesn't sound appealing and you don't like it. Many won't like it, but for us, it's what the Bible says, it's the truth. Let me read to you another passage that kind of defines what universalism is. It says this in Acts chapter three, as Peter's preaching after healing the man at the gate beautiful, it says in verse 17, now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders when you crucified Jesus, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Yes, he would. Then he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time God for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Now, that part right there, listen to what it says. Heaven must receive Jesus or he will ascend until the time comes for God to restore everything. So now that little portion right there is what they will say. God's going to restore everything. Everything is going to be made new again. And therefore, everybody's going to be saved. That's not what it says. But if you just take that little snippet right there, you can develop your own theology called universalism. Colossians 1 says this, starting in verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, meaning Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What they forget to tell you, though, and what they're forgetting about that is repentance is required. Yes, God is going to restore that which the enemy has taken, but it's restored for those that believe. So in order to get rid of the teaching of hell, God has to either be this loving God that they describe him or want him to be, but a liar, or he's God, the loving God that he is, and we know him to be, but he always tells the truth. And as I said, Jesus speaks more about hell than anybody in the Bible. So Origen came up with this idea about uh, universalism or this way of thinking. Now that was first century, but it's on the rise again where people are starting to embrace this thinking. In fact, now you have to have church that does not bring criticism or judgment on humanity. You can't be you can't speak the whole truth. In order for us to sit in your pews, you have to make us feel good. That's just not the case. And so I guess people would rather have you lie to them than tell them the truth. Jesus talked about hell all the time. And therefore, we cannot disregard that teaching because it came from Jesus. So as we continue, what does the Bible say about hell? Let's first agree that there is one, there is a hell. Jesus described it in many ways, a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place where people are thrown into outer darkness, a place where there's great agony, agony and even hell fire. It's a place of no return. You never come back from there once you go. And so these are different terms used to describe hell and what it's like. And all of them are meant to get your attention that you might understand and receive the whole counsel of the word of God, that there is heaven and there is hell. What does the Bible say about hell? There is one. And Jesus talked about it all the time. In Luke chapter 16, the parable of the last uh, Lazarus and the rich man, or is it a real story that Jesus is talking about. Some think it's an analogy, allegory, a, a story that was nice to tell to make another point. It doesn't matter much to me what you call it. 
But what it says is what's important and what it describes is what's important. Now I know that when those that we love pass away, all of us want to believe hope with all hope and desire that they are with God. And they're not in this place the Bible has been talking about as long as you've been alive called hell. The reality is if you read the entire counsel of the Word of God, the Bible, here's what you will do. You will have to embrace what Jesus says about these things or utterly reject them. And therefore, if you do, you reject them at your own peril. One gentleman said once, and I'll quote him, he says, once you board the train of unbelief, you have to ride it all the way to its destination. In other words, if you're going to get on that train, if you're going to board it of unbelief, you'll have to ride it all the way to its stop. And unbelief leads to eternal separation from God. I mean, it's just the way it is. And I'm not going to even say I wish I could tell you something different because I don't. What I want to tell you is what the Bible says. It's true. So when people pass away, just so we are on the same page, what really matters is whether or not they knew Christ as their Lord and Savior and whether or not they confessed him as Lord and the spirit of the living God, because of their confession, was living on the inside of them. Now, uh, you've read it many times. We must be born again, born of the spirit. It's not a, uh, when Nicodemus talked about it, he thought of it as being born again as a person or going back inside of your mother and coming out again. No, he's talking about being born of the spirit. In fact, Romans 8 tells us, those who have the Spirit of God in them belong to God, and those do that, who do not, do not belong to God. It's that simple. So, in order to achieve what we want to see, eternal bliss, glory with God the Father, for anybody, ourselves and anybody we know and love, they must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe. That's just the way it is. And I'm not going to even try to tell you anything different or or to make it sound a little more palatable to you, that's the way it is. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells this story about the rich man and Lazarus. And it starts in verse 19 of the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. It says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So he's telling the story about this man who had a great existence in this life. Nothing wrong with it. A matter of fact, he's not even condemning having a, a nice, wonderful life. He's not. Because if he is, then he'll have to say that if you have a life of misery, then that is bad, or it's better to be in misery than to be wealthy. He's not saying either or. He's really saying this. What it comes down to is whether or not you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So don't get caught up in thinking the poorer you are, the holier you are. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. So he says, There was a, a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So, I mean, this is, I mean, two extremes. Well, you know, very, very wealthy, very, very poor and impoverished. That's not the whole story. It's an important component of it because what happens after that tells the true story. It says, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now, since this is Jesus telling us this story, um, and I know that he's not making something up, no matter what people want to say about it, he just gave us something, I think, that we need to take to heart. Angels came and took him to Abraham's side. Angels came once he was deceased in this life. Now, the way I'm going to take that because I believe that Jesus 
spoke absolutely nothing but truth. Now, he did use parables talking about natural, earthly things, seeds, uh, fruit, uh, grain, and all these different things. He would do that. But I believe he's giving us an insight that only he can give about what happens after we leave this life. There are a lot of videos that I've seen on YouTube where people talk about they died for a time and once they did, they saw this and they saw that. Okay, I'm not going to really argue with them. I'll just take Jesus' word for it. He said, when this man died, angels came and took him to Abraham's side. Now, this is pre-cross, though. So now let's listen. It says, the rich man also died and was buried. In hell where he was in torment. Now, Lazarus dies. I think I shared this a little while ago. Lazarus dies. Angels came and attended him. The rich man died. And it said he basically was buried and opened his eyes in hell where there was torment. Now, this is Jesus talking. I'm not going to argue with Jesus. He just told me that hell is a place I never want to be. And he's also telling me by using the rich man in this story, there's nothing on this earth for you or for me, I believe, that's worth missing eternity with God. The alternative is hell. So he, this rich man opens his eyes instantly in torment then it says in hell where he looked up was in torment he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side now what I like about this is the consciousness of this man that we're about to read I mean we always talk about what do you remember in in your life and things like that in eternity do we just become totally oblivious to this life that we lived? What happens there? Well, remember, this is Jesus talking, and he's giving us a picture of this man being in hell with consciousness. It's very important to remember that. Then it says, so he called to him, meaning uh, Abraham. Let me read again verse 23. In hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. That's what he said. Just let him dip his finger in some water, touch my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Now, uh, maybe you don't like that. I'm just reading to you from the Bible. And so like the man said that I quoted earlier, if you're going to board the train of unbelief, you have to ride it all the way to its destination. So don't do that. This train that we're reading about here drives you to torment, separation from God, fire, and the greatest desire of this man is to have a dip of water on his tongue. It's a powerful message, if you ask me. Then it says, but Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. Now, he's telling him to recall his earthly life. Remember, dude? Well, he didn't say dude. But remember in your life, you had all these great things. You had luxury. I mean, did you think about Lazarus? But you want Lazarus to think about you. And so in order for him to say that to him, he has to know that he can recall this life. Probably the numerous opportunities that he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and refused it. And how many people are listening to me right now who's heard the gospel countless times? By the way, share this with somebody that you know that have not heard the gospel. I've heard it many times and yet refused it. Because this is going to make all the difference in the world. So he says to him, uh, remember your earthly life when it was full with luxury. 
So there is a bil an ability to recall in hell. And he's going to further elaborate on that point about the, the, the recollection of this life. When I read the following verses, you'll see. But he said, I can see him and where he is versus where I am is day and night. But then in the story, the story of Lazarus and the rich man and the contrast comparison and contrasting of their lives, he was in absolute luxury and Lazarus begged for just a crumb of bread and had sores about him and even dogs licked them. Remember I told you, poverty does not mean salvation. He's just telling a story about the realities of life, heaven, and hell. So, it goes on. It says this. He says, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. This chasm, this divide is you cannot cross it. What that means for us as we look at eternity and whether or not we believe the Bible, what that really means for us is once you find yourself in either of these destinies, destinations, they are fixed for eternity. They're fixed in place for eternity. I can't come to you and you can't come to me. This chasm is, it cannot be abridged, it cannot be crossed. And so once the decision is made to either believe in God, His one and only Son, Jesus, for salvation, or rejecting Him, God's one and only Son, Jesus, for salvation, we make a decision about which side of this story we're on. And remember, wealth is fine. The Bible is not condemning wealth and a good life. It's not. He's not saying that at all. But what he is saying is don't let wealth and anything on this life, in this life, cause you to miss heaven. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world? And I mean all of it. And this man didn't have the whole world. He just had a lot of luxury. But to gain the whole world and then lose his soul. What benefit is that to any man? And so the story goes on. It says this, he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. So now he recognizes the number of brothers he has. Send Lazarus to his father's house. You see the, rec the recall that this man has. And even though it doesn't say it in the story, he probably is able to recognize why he's where he is. Just like right now, everybody listening to this video knows that the Bible is the Word of God. And whatever it says, it is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. We know that. But if you choose to board the train of unbelief, you have to ride it all the way to its destination. Let's continue. It says this, Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. That's what he says. Do you know what the gospel is right now? Today, the gospel is simply this, that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised his son Jesus from the dead and confess your sins that you will be saved. What he's saying, they'll believe it if someone rose from the dead. Well, the one who's speaking to him, Jesus, will actually die and rise from the dead and they have rejected him since that day. And I hope no one listening to me right now have made that same decision. This man believed that if someone from the dead just came back and told them. I told you before, we're about to go to Israel soon in a couple of weeks. 
And every time we go to the garden tomb and we go inside, Jesus is not there. He's not there. You know why he's not there? The Bible says he is seated in heaven on the right hand of God the Father. And guess what? They're offering intercession for you and for me. That's what he does. He's inter interceding, God. Father, save them. All of those you gave to me, save them, Lord. Lord, open their ears that they would receive and hear the gospel, the saving gospel of my life, my death, and my resurrection to save them from their sin. That's what he does. And so it goes on. It says, he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. They had been hearing about Moses and the prophets in the land of Israel since Abraham. <laughs> How ironic. They've been hearing about all that God was going to do all of their lives. So have you. You've been hearing about Jesus all of your life. So you have made a decision, which I hope is to embrace him. Remember, when the universalist and the universalism theology says God is a loving God, that is true. But when it says or when they say God will not send people to hell, then they say God's a liar. You see, when you read the book of 2 Peter, it says this for all of us. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, this patient, loving God, this loving Father, that they're right when they say he's a loving Father. It says, instead, he is patient with you. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So, you're right when you say he's a loving God and a loving Father. When you say he doesn't want anyone to go to hell, you're right. You're absolutely right. But also, according to this passage, he's waiting on you to repent. Because God, this loving Father, that we all agree that he is, does not want you to perish, nor does he want me. Your being alive and able to listen to this video today is a testament to his patience that you would one day receive the gospel of his son so that you will not be like the rich man who's now at a place of no return. He's now at a place where there is torment, there is fire, there is a desire, an unquenchable thirst, and there's consciousness of the life he once lived and even the fact that he had family members. All of that consciousness is there. So if we take anything from the story with Jesus, there is a hell. We also have to keep in mind those different points that I just made to you. We may have, or whoever's there, may, according to these passages, be able to reflect back on this life and say, how I wish I had given my heart to Jesus and there's nothing I can do about it. Abraham just told me that I'll never be able to cross this divide. To me, um, and I hope to you, this will never be something that we experience because the way out or the way in to eternal life is the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God and God did raise him from the dead. And he says, repent, repent, I'm waiting on you. I don't want you to perish. Repent, I'm waiting for you because I want to receive you unto myself. So for 
different pastors and leaders that are getting away from teaching about hell, maybe it makes them seem more popular when they don't, or more likable, or they draw a bigger crowd. I'd rather you hear the truth than either of the above. I'd rather you hear this, the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ, because once it's said and done, it is said and done. So then, well, that's my story, our story, the Bible story on what the Bible says about hell. I believe you already know about the pain, suffering, the tur turmoil, the agony, the fire, the divide that cannot be crossed. You know those things. You know them. You never have to worry about them if you give your life to Jesus. God bless you, and I'll see you again next week.